is another page from our Nebraska scrapbook. The following program was funded in part by the Nebraska Arts Council and Nebraskans for Public Television. Images have played a role in Nebraska's history almost from its beginning. In the early 1840s, when explorers and eastern politicians were toying with the idea of creating a new territory west of the Missouri, artists like Carl Bodmer and George Catlin were documenting the tribes of the plains. Photography was still in its infancy. But a decade later, when photography became more portable, the first settlers were moving into the new Nebraska Territory. As the territory evolved into a state, the art and technique of photography was evolving along with it. Today, many of the most memorable images we as Nebraskans have of ourselves were made by those pioneering photographers of the late 19th and early 20th centuries. In the latter half of the 20th century, the world of the image has expanded enormously. Pictures are everywhere we look. But how many of these images are truly important? How many of them will become valued in the same way we value the sod house photographs of Solomon Butcher or the Native American portraits of John A. Anderson? In the next hour, we will become acquainted with several Nebraska photographers and their work. These photographers were selected in a juried competition sponsored by the Nebraska ETV network. From a field of 51 entries, the three independent judges selected eight finalists, representing the best in contemporary Nebraska photography. The pictures made by these photographers are important documentary records. They are unique artistic statements. These are photographers whose personal vision will help to shape the ways in which future generations will see us and our times. is best known as the author photographer who created Dust Bowl Descent, a documentary photo book which traces the legacies of the Great Depression. The Great Plains were one of the areas that was worst hit during the Great Depression, and the images came from here. When you think about the Depression, you think about Dust Bowl, and the Dust Bowl was centered here. So for all those reasons, I decided to work with the Great Plains and I can say for about 10 years, went around and tried to find some of the same people, same places. What I'm doing now is, is totally different because uh, it's very, very personal. You know, the, the reason that I'm doing it is because of that experience of looking at that print. You know, and that print itself is the end product. Whereas before, you know, in documentary kinds of things, the communication with the viewer is the end product. In this case, as far as I'm concerned, that print itself is the real, you know, is the, is the thing that's important. For Bill Gansel, the decision to abandon the documentary style has led him to new photographic problems and unusual solutions. When you're out in the, in the sand hills and you're trying to make a still photograph which is from one vantage point. And the only vantage point that you have is from ground level, 
at which you cannot see that the hill has another hill behind it, you're very, very limited. And so I kept finding myself when I was out, you know, trying to do photographs out in the sand hills, I kept finding myself trying to get to the top of the hill. During the past decade, Bill Gansel has moved away from documentary photography to shoot mostly Nebraska landscapes. A lot of landscape photographers go out and, and choose subjects which are frankly pretty easy. I mean, you get into a mountainous area and you've got ups and you've got downs, you know, and you've got uh, uh, rivers that are going through and you've got lots of lush vegetation, you know, and you've got a lot of different things going on and all of that stuff looks good on film and, and in photographs. Uh, a place like the Sand Hills, you know, it's a lot of this rolling hills, but really, unless you get close, the ecosystem looks like a monoculture. I mean, it looks like just grass. I've always been driving through it, and I've always, I never could figure out how to do photographs of it or how, how you could really um, capture what was going on there. So, I don't know, I thought, you know, and it's, it's like you take a 35 millimeter camera out there and you go back and you look at your little snapshot and you say, well, that's not what I saw. You know, that's just not what I saw. So, I don't know, I'm trying to club it over the head with a big camera, you know. For Gansel, the decision to photograph the landscape has brought him to the same methods and equipment used by the pioneer photographers of the last century. A lot of people, when they, when they decide to go large format, you know, they decide they want to go 8x10. And I've never liked the size of 8x10. And so when I decided to get a large format camera, I knew that I had to go to 11x14. The other ones are just too precious. If you're going to go large format, you might as well go all the way. First time I came up here, you know, I was just driving along and, and looking around, and it's basically flat. The roadway's been basically flat. And I had noticed the river, and I got up to the top of the hill, and I thought, wait a minute, there's something going on back over there, but I didn't really know what it was, because I really couldn't see the cliff. So I got out and walked up over here. I'm just amazed at how much this drops off. You know, I, I believe that's what, what's happened is that the river is just, you know, eroded this cliff out and it creates a real natural kind of camera platform. The only problem is that you can't find those things everywhere you need them. So you get lucky every once in a while. This is the one from that cliff, you know. The things that work for me, you know, in this. I mean, the, the reason that I, I mean, it's, it's, it's a little bit, it's basically nuts to be doing something with that larger format because you don't have to do it. You can make prints that are this big, you know, by, by developing and, and enlarging and all that kind of stuff. But for me, this, this is, it's always been real important to get, to have the feeling that you could, you know, get closer and closer and closer and keep looking at these things and still see detail and not see grain and not see any of the, you know, any of that other kind of stuff. You know, for me, it's a nice photograph. Mm -hmm. It works pretty nicely. This is from the top of the scissors lift. And the reason this works is because this foreground has time to stretch out. And the only way that that could have happened is if I was up that high, you know? You know, get, getting that extra 20 feet up makes all the difference in the world for this photograph. And so that, as crazy as it sounds, that scissors lift is now, you know, becoming a tool. <laughs> I want to get back out there again with it again so I can get up because I know now that it works. God, it's amazing because you, all of this stuff opens up now. You don't see it when you're on the ground. I found that more and more what I was doing was things that made me feel good. Here comes the fun part. And my gut just kept telling me large format, you know, go out and do landscapes. But I suppose that a lot of my, my own feeling of who I am internally comes from an identification of being a photographer.
the type of work that I do is generally called documentary, but I feel that um, it's a very personal form of documentary. I work under my own timelines, and it's important to me to spend a long amount of time in an area to get to know it and get to know the people so that there's a closeness and intimacy that I don't feel I can get just coming in for a brief period of time and passing through. It, it becomes part of my life. Um, one family I photographed a lot. I stayed with them for weeks and weeks. Uh, Steve Moreland was their son, and I saw him at he had his back to me. I was photographing at that rodeo, and when I went ar when I went around and saw who it was, I said, "You should recognize the sound of that click." And he said, "Yeah, it sounds like a rattlesnake." <laughs> he didn't like it at all, but he put up with me for a long time. It's difficult to describe the sand hills. Um, they're very delicate. They hang in a delicate balance, and it requires somebody caring for them that knows when to draw the line and what kind of you know, what what they can handle and what they can't because it's easily disturbed. Margaret's commitment to the Sand Hills has led her to a teaching position at nearby Sinte Glaska College, just across the South Dakota border on the Rosebud Indian Reservation. It's two very different cultures, even though they're side by side. I've been here two years and have done very little photography. I don't know, it seems like it's got a lot of rectangles and triangles, and it's pleasing to the eye. I like that. Well, working on the reservation, I think you always have to be um, aware of where you are and who you are. Uh, I try to be respectful anyway, but here um, it's you, you sit back and you listen and you don't speak and you show respect. Um, most of the film I've shot on the reservation has been at public events um, until I get to know them a little better, but I have shot a little at powwows and there's some prints here that I feel pretty good about. One is this young fellow that's in front of the announcer stand, and you see the older man in behind who's one of the announcers. Uh, I never take pictures of people that don't want to be photographed, so... Um, but after being here two years, I feel like now I know enough people, and they know me and know what I'm doing enough that I can go places and photograph things that I couldn't have done when I first arrived. Margaret's teaching job on the Rosebud Reservation represents a new commitment for her. But living next to the sand hills allows her to continue unfinished business. Well, I started photographing here 10 years ago, and I f don't have a sense of completion to that. I, I think the people that live in the sand hills have um, a sense of who they are and an independence that I find very attractive, and I think this is what draws me to photograph them. For Margaret McKeegan, Photography requires a long-term commitment to the various people and places she photographs. She has been returning to the Sand Hills for over a decade, and at the same time, alternating that experience with overseas trips to explore her Scottish family heritage. Um, and although we don't have any uh, close relations there now, um, I was pretty quickly accepted as um, not being one of them, but... Uh, she's an American, but she can help it. The light is so amazing in Scotland, it just reflects off everything and bounces around the way it doesn't do over here. I think I'm a person that, uh, that really gets involved with where they are. And when I'm here, yes, but when I'm in Scotland, I'm very deeply involved there and tied there. And maybe that makes me more receptive to Nebraska when I come back. One thing that I want to be working on is um, more portraits, and more portraits in which there's a, a definite relationship between the person being photographed and me as the photographer and thereby the viewer as the viewer. They become me as they look at the photographs. 
pretty good time. I find that if I'm totally alone with them, it works much better. Whether it's men or women, they may be a little uncomfortable with what everybody else is thinking, and they're going to get teased, oh, you're getting your picture taken, smile, you know, all that kind of stuff that is not there if you're alone with them. This kind of thing is very difficult to photograph, the um, rounding up the cattle and driving them somewhere, because as a photographer, you want to be in close, but you have to be very careful that you don't interfere with what's going on. Uh, naturally, to tell a story, it helps to have a lot of photographs. But I like to choose the photographs um, that feel complete in and of themselves, each image, so it can stand on its own. I don't make the photographs for other people, really. I, I make them uh, because I, it's what I need to do. For Kent Klima, the commitment to photography requires extraordinary effort and planning. He was seriously injured in an automobile accident several years ago. But when he regained consciousness after months in a coma, the first thing he asked for was his view camera. The accident left Kent with limited mobility and impaired speech. Today, he is continuing photography, although he now requires the help of an assistant. The leather handle goes to the front. Actually, I started off doing architecture commercially. And I would always use nature as my subject for my own photography. The quote that I like is that the most abstract forms are found in nature. So I try to use that a lot. Corn is not quite as good, but beans are good. Mm -hmm. For this project, Kent chose to make pictures that emphasize the strong lines found in the rural Nebraska landscape. I was mostly interested in things that had longer lines. Nebraska is a rural state, and lines are around everywhere. Dark 
Kent Klima, like many professional photographers, approaches the craft of photography very scientifically. Nothing is left to chance. Maybe a third down from 32. Recently, Kent completed a major project documenting Omaha's Jobbers Canyon before it was torn down. I did not do as much as I wanted to do this year, but I don't know if I could ever do that much. Two or three days a week, Kent devotes to darkroom work or trips out to make photographs. Even though he has to overcome many obstacles in getting his work done, he remains optimistic. You never know what's over the next deal until you see it. So don't stop and wait for something to happen. You could miss what's going on over the next hills. I want you to turn your head this way, just a fraction there, right in there. Omaha photographer Larry Ferguson has chosen to create a series of portraits of one of his early supporters, Norman Geske, the former director of Lincoln's Sheldon Memorial Art Gallery. I'm going to try to keep photographs in this hall as much as possible. Yeah. The best thing I can try to do to try and to get closer to somebody is to be uh, very friendly, warm, receptive, responsive to them. Yes. Yeah. It's a really gorgeous print. I think you got the last one that I've actually printed. Really? Again, positive reinforcement's a wonderful way to uh, be able to photograph somebody intently. As the portrait photographer, I have to be in control of the situation. I can't be intimidated by somebody. I was reading your words up in the Omaha World Herald. But really, it's a matter of being aware of what's going on and realizing that you can be in control of the situation just by doing certain things. Are those photograph glasses, Norman? Yes. They darken up in the light? Do you have any others that aren't photographs? No. Nope. Well, we'll have fun then. <laughs> <laughs> you mean I'm gonna appear to be wearing shades? Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. All yeah, right. we'll have to watch out. Sorry. Right. Norman's a real uh, beautiful person. He allows you to do what you want to do, and I think that's one thing that's helped him be able to help promote other people's careers through the years, is that he has believed in other people and in his own judgment about those people. Four seconds, Norman. Well, just look right in here for me, and, and don't smile. It's going to be too long an exposure for you to to smile for me here, yeah? Okay? And hold on, right there. Good job. Let's go process it. Let's see what this looks like. Come on. <laughs> We're gonna be... Oh, I don't know whether I want to see the results or not. Oh, yeah, you do. You definitely do. There's always an initial shock. Due to the high cost of large format film, Ferguson uses 8x10 Polaroids as photographic sketches before exposing real film. Far cry from working out in the field, isn't it? Yes. We created glass plates and so forth. It's all, it's all gone. We just gotta wait. Just gotta wait. Yeah, we'll, we'll try a couple here and then we'll try some and maybe in front of the window, some in the kitchen perhaps. Here's what we look like. Well, I guess I can't do that. That's what we look like. <laughs> Smiling is something that's real ephemeral. It comes and it goes, and it's it's usually a surface sort of characteristic that's very lightly taken. And I've gone through that with other clients also, and it's like they always sort of like the smiling ones, and I go, oh, yeah, but that's really not the most powerful picture to uh, be working with in through here. And that's what I really needed to do, was, was make a really powerful picture of Norman.
contemplative, do you think? Yes, I suppose. But you're not looking like you're down in the dumps terribly. <laughs> you mean when it gets real serious? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's, see, that, this is the typical problem that happens with people who have their portraits made, is that those who have it made really don't like it a lot of times, but the other people around them love it. Sure. Larry Ferguson thinks of himself as an artist. He lives directly above his studio, which is in an old two-story storefront in Omaha's South Side. In recent years, his interest has turned toward creating a reputation for himself as a serious studio portrait photographer. These were just up at the Joslin and a gallery out in western Nebraska. Today, Norman and Jane Geske are here to view the portraits Larry took of Norman and Lincoln and to have some in-studio portraits made. Yeah, that's nice, because it has that smile. You like him smiling a bit more, don't yeah. you? Yeah, right. Basically, what happened that day is exactly what I set up in my mind that morning to have happen. And I've learned that that's a real key factor for me in being able to make things work now. And uh, thinking through thoughts about how I'd like to make a picture of Norman that would fit into my new series of the in-studio portraits, and how I wanted to make something that would be very close so that Norman could be just uh, enormously large in the picture. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to get in closer yet, Norman. Oh, oh. <laughs> I end up just a few inches away from you. Hard to even just get in focus when I'm up this close, Norman. Norman Geske recognized Larry's talent early in his career and offered him a show at the Sheldon when he was just starting out. Now, hold on. When I first started making the work and it started to be successful, I couldn't figure out why, why people responded to it. And it uh, first started off, you know, with wide open landscape work, which was all about my uh, bringing up as a child out on the farm and being uh, familiar with the land and wanting to be able to utilize that. And then I went in to photograph uh, environmental portraits of people where uh, all of their surroundings would uh, help to uh, identify what the person was and what they did. Lately, within the past two to three years, it's all been in-studio uh, portraits, which are all real close. And I think it was a natural progression from going from not really understanding very much of who I was, not being able to relate very much to myself in the outside world at that time. That's why I had a lot of distance between me and the people when I made the pictures. Now that's all dramatically changed, and I can be very up close with people, and I can be real comfortable with them, and I think it's a result of my being very comfortable with myself now. Now, right there, Norm. Hold, hold it again for me. As a student, Larry Ferguson was torn between becoming an actor or pursuing a career in photography. But he's always thought of himself as an artist. Because certainly I know I could turn around and, and in six months' time, I could be heavily involved in commercial photography if I wanted to and be making a quarter million dollars a year. It would not be unrealistic within one year's time. At the moment, though, I'm choosing not to do that. Uh, and it's a very conscious decision. If I can't sign my name to it, I'm really not very much interested in doing it. I don't really do things just for the money. I had never been in a helicopter before I did this job. And a pilot, I think, that was just, he was a fighter pilot in Nam. And uh, I think he figured if it's not shooting back, hell, I don't care how close I get to it, you know, I get as close as you want to get. And he, and he got so close that I had to say, back off, because I could, I, the thing was more than filling the frame. It's an impressive sight, by the way, when you get up there that close to that thing. I think, I think it's 32 feet tall, you know, it's, it's, a hunk of, it's a hunk of bronze. Roger Brune is best known for his dramatic portrait of the sower atop the Nebraska State Capitol building. In addition to his commercial work, he had been photographing historic and contemporary architecture. I'm really interested in architecture. I like, I like the formal qualities of architecture. I like the, the different feeling that there is to different kinds of buildings and, uh, and different kind of photographs that you make of different kinds of buildings. For this project, Roger chose to create portraits of people who live and work along Lincoln's O Street. I mean, 
mean, every city has got a variety of stuff. What's interesting in Lincoln is that it's all around one street. You know, it's the great western town. It's got one street. It shoots right through the middle of the town, and if you want to have a business, that's where you want to be. You have to do what you like doing. You have to do what interests you. You have to have a commitment to it. Uh, the, the, any project that you get into as an artist, you, you have to have some personal commitment to it. You have to like it. You have to be, a, to be interested in it, I think. You know, this is an interesting idea. There, there's culture along this street, you know. Yeah. A lot of culture that's, that's interesting. It's ephemeral. It's here today. It's gone tomorrow. Can you read it? Yeah. Good. <laughs> yeah. That's good. Okay. I think it's strange to have such a, such a mix of stuff, you know. I mean, uh, you, you've got your business district. You've got a kind of a combat zone. Uh, and you've got a, a, a street with small businesses and all of that packed into a mile and a half. Roger Brune feels that his portraits can make a statement about O Street and its significance. Portraiture is something that is relatively new to me, really, in any, in any really um, in any sense where I really try to think about what I was doing. Uh, because I worked with sort of with inanimate stuff. And it's really exciting for me. It's a, it's a really exciting new thing to be doing because um, portraits are a little bit like sex in the sense that you, you get real close to someone in a real short period of time. Um, I love that. And, they're, they're, and the, that notion of interaction, a portrait is not just a picture of a person. I mean, there's got to be something going on between you and that other person. I shot a federal judge down here in the oh, no. courthouse. Oh, what a contrast I'll be. And it can be something very momentary. It can be something that you kind of set up. Go ahead and put your foot up on there again if you can. In an almost artificial sense, you yeah. put someone yeah, like where they might not ordinarily stand. Maybe even a little more. But you're trying to get a result that looks right, because, I mean, after all, the end product is a photograph. It's a visual object. It is a little bit aggressive. I mean, you're intruding yourself into other people's spaces. And when you do portraiture, you, you I mean, you really, you, you are in a sense taking something away from that other person. You always hear anthropologists talk about certain uh, aboriginal peoples who don't like to have their photographs taken because they think that when you take that photograph, you have a piece of them now. Hi, how are you? Colleen, how are you? Pretty good. John, John, Jim, John. Roger. Roger. <laughs> like with this O Street thing, I have to contact these people. I don't like just walk and spring this on them. I like, I like to let them know that I'm coming. For one thing, that increases my chances that they're going to say yes. But, but I, so I have to write letters. I have to make telephone calls. The whole thing is very difficult to set up. If I spend a half an hour photographing you, I'll come away from that, from my own point of view at least, feeling much closer to you and like I know you much better, and like you showed me something than I did if I would just have a conversation with you for the same length of time. I'm outside, she's inside. And the only way that you can see into the inside of the building is where my, the shadow of my head and my hands, that's my, those are my fingers on the, on the camera. Where they block the reflection is the only place that you can see into the building. Otherwise, what you see, ref you see the street itself reflected back on the edges. So this is, I think this is wonderful. It's wonderful. It's wonderfully complex and ambiguous, and uh, I'm, I'm very pleased with these on the whole. Let me show you one that was far more difficult, I thought, to judge Warner about. See, it isn't very often that you try those cases without a jury. It's yeah. just not an interesting, visually interesting room, and I'm trying to, to, you know, work with context and environment with these things. And so I had a really tough time with that room, which just, I, I just couldn't make it look like anything. And actually, I would like this one a whole lot better if it were not for this line, which is just simply too close to his head. If I could, if that line were up here, if I could have changed the, my angle on it in such a way to move that line, but that, that line is what kills this photograph for me. Otherwise, I think it's okay. And I did, you know, I did some of it in his office. And these are, uh, these are nice, but I, they just don't grab me. It just doesn't, it doesn't say, to me, it doesn't say anything about him being a judge. This is what I've 
I finally decided that I would use. It's interesting to have him in the jury box because I like, I like the way that the empty chair sort of symbolize all, all of the people, all of us maybe, for whom he is making decisions the way we're not there. So it's in a kind of symbolic sense, I, I like this one. With the one of Zabludgel here, or whatever, yeah, I yeah, wanted yeah. to show the studio situation. And I think I, I, this gets it, you know, you've got the hair light back here. I just used his light and plugged into his lights. This is his background. We just sort of turned him around, just turned the tables on him, as it were. You know what other people go through now. But I like the way he gets framed here by this, uh, by his camera stand in the background. And so compositionally, I liked it, and uh, that was the only one I printed. Well, this one here, the Trump guys, yeah, that's fine. That's good. there yeah. again, I, this one I looked through the contact sheets pretty carefully, but this is the only thing I printed. It does a great job of showing the context. I, I love the way this, that this is almost like it was stripped in there on a piece of tape. I think it captures those two guys. I'd like it if people would be very interested and just be knocked out by this so street stuff. Maybe they will, maybe they won't. I like it. Well, I'm not one of those people who, who's really trying to figure myself out via photography. Uh, I think I'm more I'm trying to say something. I'm not necessarily about myself, but about other things. Okay, go up, up. What happens if you go back a little bit, just a little bit? Let's, I, I'll, I'll try one like this, okay? I like the light on your face, just like that. I so have some ideas in my head, but it never always works out that's that right. way. Okay, it's more go. of um, One, two, a performance of sorts, I think, and an interaction that I'm going after. And I'm not worried about who's going to look at it and what they're going to think about it. Sorry, I told you guys we were finished here. Well, I lied. Susan Horn makes portraits. However, her work goes beyond what we normally expect from a portrait. She tries to achieve an image that expresses a psychological truth or portrays the essence of the relationship that exists between her subjects. Yeah, 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 Virginia, what you just did. Sometimes, Worked as far out. as gesture goes, I'll see somebody make a gesture that I'll say, hold that gesture, and um, it was a natural gesture at one point, but I want to try to get them to reenact that gesture, which is kind of a strange thing, yeah, I guess, so to do, but I have to do that. I like the way you had your toes, though, because most of my exposures are so long that they really have to hold that gesture. And somehow out of that, when they're holding that sort of natural gesture, an intensity comes out of that. that I, I like that when that happens. They know they have to hold still, so they're sort of frozen. Virginia's looking out the window. It's, it's as if she's looking to the future, or she's, she's looking off somewhere. and. Uh, the idea that Stacy too is is looking somewhere and Stacy sees herself. You know, we don't know who Virginia sees, and it, it's almost uh, metaphorical in character, I guess, because there are these little symbols that happen in this photograph, which is something that I like to do sometimes. I've worked with Pam for years. She was my roommate in 1969, and so I've taken a lot of photographs of her, and I, th I thought that would be interesting to, to have people that are sort of new, and then somebody that I've photographed many, many times, although I know Emily very well, I've never really photographed the two of them together, so that part was new for me. Good job. Good job. Okay, why don't we... Uh, Try one, one more similar to this one. Okay, Emily, I want you, can you kind of look toward the window a little bit? Can you look your eyes over here? Do you know how to do that? Yeah, just like that. 
I'm interested in photographing children. I guess because I have children, but I mean, we look at them as cute little unthinking things. And I want to make photographs of children that show that they have feelings. And I mean, they're, they're you know, they embody everything that you are, except they're just younger. It's fun, you know, I want to make it fun for, for Emily, too. I think kids grow up not always liking to have their picture taken. That's too ouchy. That's too hurt. What about this trashy. dress? Put your arm here. Like this? Is this how it goes? Yeah. Because you get away with jewelry. No. It's hard to take pictures of kids. And Emily's awful cute, but it's hard to take meaningful pictures of kids, too. That's. One quest that I have is to take meaningful pictures of kids, and here I'm dressing them in silly costumes. <laughs> okay, Emily. Yeah, I like it when your eyes look back here at me. I see it as a collaborative effort. Uh, most of the time, you know, I really want a direct confrontation okay. with the, the people that I'm photographing, so I want to look into those, those eyes and know that there's there's a contact, there, that there's some intelligence. and But this is so beautiful. She's looking out the window. And again, it, it happened again, you know, when I had Stacy's mom look out the window. It's, it, they're looking to somewhere else. And, and it sets up a real complicated relationship between me and that, and then them together. This is a really um, early photograph that was part of my uh, curiosity about light and form and skin, and I did a lot of nude studies. I like to think that I can make photographs of people in thinking states, and especially photographs of women in thinking states, because I don't think that's an idea that they... I know oh, women have been so terribly abused and cheesecaked, and I want to make pictures that make you think that there's something behind those eyes, there's some thinking going on. If I'm maybe trying to get at anything, maybe it's the truth. <laughs> Why don't you just hold him right in front of the truck here, or I'll get a photograph. Come on out, Mark. Okay, looking this way. Act like it's cold, Mark. All right, let's go get another one. Good job. I got a mail there, don't we? Yep. No? Yeah. Isn't it? Yeah. Got a mail. Throw him in the back of the blazer. Okay. Okay. We're set. I didn't start this out on purpose. All of a sudden, I started realizing that hunting was changing a lot. Uh, the four-wheel drive trucks, the uh, two-way radios, uh, just the way they're going about it today. So I started just documenting hunters, and the more I started putting the photographs up, the more I started seeing that people uh, would have a reaction to them. And, uh, so I kept with it, and uh, I feel it's an important subject to be documented. Um, my encounter, my relationship with somebody is more important than going out and just photographing. I like to use that as a record, and the camera comes out second. I always uh, use the camera after I've met the person, after I've uh, spent some time with them, got their confidence. and. Um, then I make a record of it with the camera. Let's get somebody in the shot here. 
For over 20 years, Bob Stark has been photographing hunters and hunting in rural Nebraska. Let's get a group shot here. For this program, Bob has chosen to photograph the members of the Byron Coyote Club, who meet on Sundays during the winter months. They're on behind him here. I've never had anybody okay. come back and say to me that you shouldn't take these photographs because it's gross or it's bad or they're anti-honey. I've always liked a photograph where the person in the photograph is looking right at the viewer, uh, the camera. It's straight on. It's confrontal. They know the camera's there. They know I'm there. They know why I'm taking the photograph. Uh, I've never been a candid or a person uh, that photographs people from afar. And I think it's because I like people. I like to interact with people. I enjoy getting to know people, what their lives are like. And the photograph says a little bit about that, that I want to confront them. I want to stand there and get to know them. I want them to look at the viewer, the viewer to look back at them. It's not a, uh, a shot where they're looking away. Nebraska, coyotes are considered pests. They are legal to hunt year-round. But uh, after a while, you start getting used to it. You get looking for what a coyote, where they're going to run, what they're going to be doing, and then uh, give them directions so they can move in on them. You look at things that you can identify with, and in being a documentary photographer, you, you try to figure out what is the most obvious thing that's going on around me that I should be photographing over a period of time. You want to grab the coyote? We'll do a shot here. I know a lot about hunting. I've seen hunting since I was a child, people doing this. And there's always been the photograph of the hunter with their game after the hunt. And I started photographing hunters with their game and with their trucks and with their guns. Uh, as a record because it's changing so fast and I think uh, the time won't be too distant away that uh, there won't be hunting like this. Okay, yeah, just pick him up. Yeah, hold him just like that. Her, I'm sorry. Act like you're not cold. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I have photographed uh, many people doing many different things and I don't try to be judgmental about why somebody is doing something. Some of the people will find uh, the coyote sequence uh, uh, violent. Uh, they, they won't understand what's going on necessarily, or it's easy to judge when you look at somebody else and you're removed, and when you look at the photographs of a dead coyote up close, uh, that's gonna be um, uh, very difficult for some people to look at because it involves death. <laughs> have a goal where my photographs are going to end up. I think they're straightforward documents. Um, they call them art. That's for somebody else to call them art because I don't think mine are art photographs. I think they're just straight documentary records of things that I've seen, found interesting, and wanted to record. Journalist who works with the Lincoln Journal Star. Travel in style, huh? <laughs> I've never had a journalism course. Um, sometimes I think that's an advantage. Our audience isn't journalism people. Yeah. I mean, I can I have pictures where. There are real subtle things that I look at and it makes me smile, but when it's on newsprint and somebody's spending this much time with it, the subtlety, although it may indeed help the picture, it truly gets lost. And I think because of that, we have to try and do a real good job of making our stuff immediately accessible.
but I just like making any kind. And I guess it just worked out that the kinds of pictures that I do are the kinds of pictures that work in a newspaper or in a magazine as opposed to the kind of pictures that hang on a wall in a gallery. Over the years, Ted has covered every conceivable kind of subject, from politics to sports, always working against very tight daily deadlines. We do a good job, you know. You've got reporters everywhere. You've got copy coming in from around the world. Wire pictures coming in from around the world. And it all comes together and it all comes out every day without fail. For today's assignment, Ted is following a subject well known to all Nebraskans. Ted has come to Milligan, Nebraska to follow his own story idea, a look at six-man football. This special game is played by schools too small to field an 11-man team. The Milligan Roosters personify the town. In order to hold on to that, if they have to play six-man football, they're going to play six-man football. But what I wanted to do was show the two extremes. Well, I'm here to photograph you. At least in this state. All right. Talking the very smallest unit to a major league, big Mondo production. Virtually every Saturday during football season, Ted is on assignment with the Cornhuskers. For this project, he originally wanted to contrast Big Red football with the small-town six-man teams like the Milligan Roosters. One of the things that's okay to happen is the story can grow, it can change direction. And in fact, it did. It did a lot. It's not a football story, as it turns out. It's a story about the town wanting to retain its identity, and this is one of the ways in which the town retains its identity. We passed, you guys got a block, Paul. You're not hitting anybody. Nobody's blocking up front. On this night, the Roosters are mismatched. With only seven players available, they are easily handled by the unbeaten Prague Panthers. The athletic contest itself is a convenient vehicle for showing the pride that the town has in who they are. The enthusiasm level is so high for the number of people that are there. It's something that these people wear as a badge. You know, in a lot of small towns in Nebraska, um, you drive by them and there'll be a sign out, state class C girls basketball champions 1974 and somebody's still keeping it up that's still important and they still talk about that I just like for people to be able to pick up the paper and look at the picture and that it will evoke some sort of emotion it doesn't always need to be joy. It can be sorrow. It can be compassion. Um, it can be uh, love. It can be anger. Um, just some sort of emotion. And then, then if that happens, then I've done my job.
Pictures have the power to arouse strong emotions. Because of this, they are powerful in ways that words alone can never approximate. The photographs that will be remembered by future generations of Nebraskans will be made by those artists who are able to capture some essential element of what it means to be a Nebraskan of the late 20th century. We have no way of knowing how future generations will see and judge us. But whether we like how we appear or not, one thing is certain. Some of the photographs being made by these photographers will survive and become a part of our common heritage. To purchase a VHS cassette of this program for 1995, write GPN, Post Office Box 80669, Lincoln, Nebraska, 68501, or call 402-472-2007.